we are live. So, welcome to 2020's 2D Monster Hunter Review and Thoughts film. And we are gonna dive into... I realize this video is long. I'm gonna do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video to see its length. Check the time codes in the description box. I wanted to watch this in a theater, but it didn't come to one near me, so I found the Blu-ray on sale, and here we are. I'm not 100% sure if you can hear, there's like a, a low hum of a machine. I don't think the microphone is picking it up, but if you can hear it, it's just a dehumidifier, nothing. Yeah. Now, I am currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. Now, there are several major appeals of video games and adaptations of video games, and one of them is that they can have many wild concepts, have them play off each other, such as magic power versus robots, and, yeah, outside of these adaptations, you will only have a few at a time. I mean, yeah, this one does have a couple. I, I think that there could have been more, but it's better than nothing. And, let's see. Yeah, another major appeal is that with their wild concepts, they can give compelling commentary on real issues with greater efficiency than non-comic, non-video game stuff. Ultimately, this does not really do that. Now, content warning and or trigger warning. This movie features the following, and I am going to be discussing at least some of the potentially triggering content. Let's see. Torture, kidnapping, ableism, gaslighting, Xenophobia, murder, body horror, and yeah, that is it. So, also please note, I have a tendency to sometimes when I'm discussing a sense of the subject to use descriptive terms that I consider neutral that other people considered negative, so if I say something that sounds judgmental, it's probably just that I take for granted that people know I'm being descriptive, not judgmental. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. It's not that I don't care. I'm just not as good at this as, yeah. And I'm also going to do my best to pronounce the names correctly. Again, if I get it wrong, it's not that I'm intentionally making fun of them. The movie is rated PG-13, and so is this video. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie, in another tab. I won't mind. Now, I got this on sale, so anything negative I say in this is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset to how it compares to what it's adapting, other movies like it, what I was expecting, the trailers and other marketing. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I said in this video are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during the, this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. So, the only version of this movie that I have seen is the one on Blu-ray. And this is my first viewing. I started recording this video very soon after I got done watching it so that it would be fresh in my mind. Now, the plot. Some military people, I think rangers, are teleported from Earth to, I think, okay, if I recall correctly, the movie just calls it The New World as opposed to Our World. And... Yeah, the that's what I'm going with. The New World has 
monsters of various shapes and sizes and surviving even with military training is a challenge. Now, Mila Jovovich plays Captain Artemis. I, I'm not sure, I think for a while they just refer to her as Captain or The Captain, but it's not really, it's not a spoiler that that's her name. Yeah, I guess, I guess, I mean, in the first Resident Evil movie, it's only in the end credits that she's identified as Alice, so I guess the, the, you know, Paul W. Anderson was trying to do the same thing, maybe. But, yeah, with Artemis being transported to the New World, it means that the character can act as an audience insert. Because if you pick up a controller and play a video game, and you're playing, you know, a, a character who's an adult, being taught something important to know to play the game, that the character should already know, you as a player kind of accept that as being necessary to the game. But in order to do that kind of thing in a movie, you kind of need that character to be transported from another world so that they don't, you know, so that there's some reason why they don't know these things. And filmmakers very frequently choose our world since that means that we, the viewer, can very easily relate to the character. But it's still frustrating to watch. I think the movie would have been better if the main character had been someone who was very used to this world. And over the course of the movie, we see more of what this very different world is like, some of how Star Wars movies handle it. I I suppose I could understand an argument against... And I, I personally thought Tony Jaa did an excellent job in this movie. I could understand why some would say it shouldn't be him, because he doesn't speak English in the movie. So, yeah, I could understand that, but... You know, that, that means that he, if he... If he says something to another character, it's going to be subtitled or something, and a lot of people can't stand subtitles. But I do think they could have, you know, you'd have to rewrite it. You couldn't just, like, edit it to, to change that. But, yeah, hypothetically, have Miljovovic play a character who grew up in the New World and just, yeah... Now, if I understand correctly, I haven't played any of the games, but if I understand correctly, basically, in the games, you just... I, I don't think the games are supposed to be set in the real world. They're just... they're set in this other world. I'm not sure it's explained. And, yeah, you play as a monster hunter. You hunt monsters. And... I'm not sure, I, I don't know if there's a lot of, of plot, but certainly this movie isn't especially concerned with the plot of the games, just the main concept. And yeah, you know, the, the at the very start, these rangers have no idea what's going on. And, you know, gradually through, like, training, you know, you know there's going to be a montage yeah, they, they, you know, they get into a situation where they can better fight against these monsters. Now, let's see, the action is fun and exciting. It's not ashamed of the fantasy roots. You know, I've, I've seen some, you know, I think it might have been on Metacritic user reviews where... Some people just said, if you if you like fantasy, you're going to love this movie. And, you know, for sure, there are a lot of fantasy elements. I, I understand that some big fans of the games don't think there are enough monsters or creatures in general in this from the games. And I can understand why. I think, you know, I think they fit in about as many as they could without ending up just like, you know, the thing is, the moment you're in a video game, like, if you spend five minutes killing a creature, you know, that's enough. You don't need, you know, if, if another hour passes before you see another one of those creatures, you're going to be okay, you know. But if in a movie you see a creature for five minutes, it's not going to mean that much to the audience. 
you know, it's 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 really difficult to do a good adaptation of of this kind of thing. You know, at least if you're doing an adaptation of a game that's relatively straightforward and is set in our world, doesn't have that much, like, you know, the Max Payne adaptation could have been so much better if, yeah, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try not to derail this video by talking about the incompetence of, I believe his name is John Moore, just terrible director, I don't know how is, is he still getting work? I'm not sure, but for a while he kept getting work, in spite of his movies turning out terrible, but anyway, the, the, yeah, you know, if, if what you really want out of the movie is creatures and this world that is more like something out of the fantasy genre than it's particularly similar to our world, yeah, there's a pretty decent amount of that. Now, the IMDb more like this list compares this to Bloodshot, which I rated a 5 out of 10. Resident Evil 6, which is a 6. Resident Evil 4, 7. Resident Evil 5, 5. Resident Evil 1, 7. And Resident Evil 3, 7. And, yeah, I mean, for sure, there's... I could definitely see comparing it to Resident Evil 6, because several of Paul's bad habits show up from that movie that he didn't have before that movie. And yeah, you know, in general, it's it is a very Paul W. S. Anderson movie. And yeah. I now that I've watched this, the only two things that Paul W. S. Anderson has written or directed that I haven't watched yet. And yes, reviews are on their way for the, you know, I've, I've reviewed everything of his except for the, let's see, the first three, the first three Resident Evil movies, yes. The only two things of his, of that, that he's written and or directed that I haven't watched yet are The Sight and Shopping. And yes, I do own copies, and yes, reviews are forthcoming. And it's... Yeah, I, I will go more into it, but for now, I'll just say that, yeah, I, I, I make it a point. When, when he makes a movie, I watch it and review it. Now, let's see. Yeah, so this movie does have some representation. So it's pretty terrible that I have to say the following, but some people won't watch this if they aren't sure of the following. Not every straight white cis man in this film is depicted as being evil, inferior, etc. There are multiple characters that fall into, yeah fall into those categories and let's see I yeah that is so other than people like me who keeps going to Paul W. Anderson movies how does he keep getting to adapt video game Move video games into movies. I'll grant DOA, DOA is good for what it was, but he wasn't directing or writing, he only produced it. The first Mortal Kombat movie is not that good. The Resident Evil movies just got worth, worth, worse with each one. Who watched Resident Evil 6 and was like, we gotta get this guy? Actually, they were working towards making this movie from back in 2012, when Anderson put out the fifth Resident Evil movie, which really felt like he was completely out of ideas. So, why keep going? Apparently, among the reasons that he keeps getting work are that the studios don't have problems with him. You know, he doesn't argue or, or suggest things that would kill their profits. Although on this, in, in this one, I, I don't know if it was his idea or someone else's and he just didn't realize, but apparently there was this joke that 
some you know some some Asian communities felt were were racist against Asians, and because of that, apparently it didn't you know the the movie was like completely boycotted in China, and I it really doesn't strike me as an intentional you know but it doesn't like racism not being on purpose is still racism anyway returning to yeah the reasons he keeps getting work he gets the films done on time and under budget he works with small or medium sized budgets and earns significant profits young viewers love a lot of what he does in the movies that others would call bad filmmaking now I cannot comment on the 3D I have not been able to watch it in 3D but I can imagine it's like he's he's done pretty good work with 3D in the past so yeah if you have a chance to you know watch it and I mean 3D Blu-ray, I don't know if that's... Yeah. It, it may well be, be worth it. So, this was written by Paul W. Anderson. And in addition to writing this, he wrote all six Resident Evil movies. He wrote the first Death Race movie. He wrote Alien vs. Predator. And... Yeah, he also wrote The Sight and Shopping, the only two that I have not watched of the ones he wrote. So, Paul W. Anderson started working towards this in 2012. He, you know, the, yeah, he discovered the Monster Hunter series on travels to Japan around 2008 and had become a fan of the series, considered a film adaptation as a passion project. Yeah, see that's that's the risk you take when you make a good video game. Paul W. Anderson might make a movie about it. Just, you know, keep that in mind. Don't forget about Crunch. Okay, don't forget about Crunch. It, it seriously sucks that AAA companies are treating their employees this badly, but yeah, one of the greatest risks you run if you make a really good video game is that Paul W. Anderson might make a movie out of it. And let's see the right. Paul W. Anderson and producer Jeremy Bolt, who also helped make sure that they could make six Resident Evil movies. I I remember watching the first one and even back then I was like do people really want more of this? Apparently did. Apparently they did. Paul Lee Resension and producer Jeremy Bolt anticipate a series of Monster Hunter films so be warned. And yeah Anderson said he was drawn to the property not only because of the series popularity also for the incredibly beautiful immersive world they've created he captures that pretty decently I mean once again I haven't played so I can't say you know it's possible it's only 10% as but the movie does you know deliver on a, a beautiful exotic world that yeah like it you know they filmed this in real locations, but the movie does make it feel like you're watching something from a different world. And I do really appreciate they actually did go to some of these places in spite of like heat and transportation and all this stuff. It just it it does something it adds something that you cannot get with a green screen. And Right. Originally, his script would have explained why certain legends in the real world 
seemed to align with the monsters from the fantasy world. And originally he was it was going to be a young adult and I, let's see called Lucas so I guess presumably a male character and yeah the script developed over the intervening years Anderson moved away from the young adult concept as the genre had become overused in Hollywood and instead had developed a script based on the premise set premises set by Avatar and Rage of the Lost Ark yeah if if this movie had been young adult yeah that pretty sure that train has sailed by now I'm not sure anybody's making or clamoring for movies like that anymore. And, right, Anderson said that part of the film's inspiration was based on a crossover event in the game Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker with Monster Under Freedom Unite in 2010, in which a military squad briefly faced monsters from the Monster Hunter series. See, that's another thing. If you make a video game, you come up with... A, that sounds like such a cool concept. Like, I would I would definitely play that. You know, it's not for my carpal tunnel, but the... the I, miss, I really miss video games. Anyway, the, the... Yeah, if you come up with a super cool concept, there's some chance Paul W. Anderson's going to put it in a movie. Now... So, yeah, I'm going to... Angry Joe pointed out, dialogue or plot would just get in the way, so there isn't any. Big fans of the games don't want Military Monster Hunter, but they're really just there to show how tough the monsters are. And watching the movie is like watching someone play the game. And I forget if it was him who, who said it, but someone said that, you know, the, the thing that people want from an adaptation of Monster Hunter is monster hunting and there's there's monster hunting in this you know so yeah if if that is the the barometer if that's the bar then is that what bar is short for anyway Barbara if that is the Barbara then yeah now the movie <laughs> plot twists Wow yeah the movies plot twists I mean, if you've watched other Paul W. Anderson movies, yeah, there are some really ridiculous plot twists. Let's see. I suppose there aren't, overall, there aren't too many of them. I don't know that I would necessarily say that they're bad. Some of them are very weird. It's, it's one of those things where, like... He'll make part of his movie, like, just really, really fun and cool and creative. And you're left wondering, why isn't the whole movie like this? And that's something one of the twists does. Yeah, it brings in elements that, yeah, but let's see. The, I would say the, the... The twists, some of them will, you know, catch you off guard. I think some of them you're likely to be able to guess. Yeah, that... I mean... Yeah, this this is one of those movies that once... There's, there's a certain twist in this movie. Once you've seen it, it's like... How does this movie's world work then? If, but that's Paul W. Anderson. There's, there's frequently his his movies will have at least one bit of writing where you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. If if that were the case, then this world would look completely different. Yeah. So this movie is also directed by Paul W. Anderson. And yeah, so he, yeah, he directed Resident Evil's one, 
let's see, one, four, five, and six. Yes, he did not direct two or three. He also directed Pompeii, the Three Musketeers, Death Race, Alien vs. Predator, Mortal Kombat, Event Horizon, Soldier, and once again, Shopping and the site, which I had not watched. So, I used to enjoy Paul W. Anderson movies with a lot less reservation. I became aware of him around 99. I liked him at the time. You know, I I realized that there were problems between, you know, in, in his Mortal Kombat movie and Event Horizon and such. The, the yeah. When Resident Evil Apocalypse first came out, I had fairly few criticisms of it. I never thought that his Alien vs. Predator movie was any good. I... Yeah, I, I... I don't know that I've ever looked at one of his movies and thought, okay, that's just... that's a good movie. But there are... You know, so, yeah, some of them... They can they can be fun, you know, if you if you watch them with the right mindset. I think it was with his Three Musketeers movie that I fully accepted that he's legitimately not a good filmmaker. He has some technical skill, but he's bad at other aspects of filmmaking. Then there were a few years where I didn't take any enjoyment from his work. Those were dark days. I think it was as of 2016. I've enjoyed his work whilst acknowledging that his movies are not particularly good, although he has a few good ideas. But yeah, let's see, 2016, yeah, yeah, when I watched Resident Evil 6, I was 100% on board with this is gonna be stupid but fun, and just as long as, yeah. So, some of the things that Paul DeBeers Anderson very frequently does in movies that I would consider mistakes, I realize not everybody agrees with me on all of these, and I actually, I ended up writing in a couple of uh, positives as well. Anyway, his movies are gloriously stupid. He will make it seem like a threat is easily defeated, only to reveal it's much worse than you think. Or make it seem like there's no threat to begin with, and then reveal a huge threat. Other anticlimaxes, he will introduce a ton of characters that we think are going to be important, very frequently because he treats them like they're going to be important and then kill them off unceremoniously. Sometimes he'll make an, a movie about characters trying to escape alive, and then he'll have almost all, sometimes even all, killed. Characters will survive things they shouldn't, which can really lead to a complete loss of the sense of danger in the movie. Including, like, he'll have a threat completely, like, easily kill like military personnel and then like a civilian with no skills will survive you know m one or more of them and it's like I mean do you want us to think these are a threat or don't you? You will have obnoxious penis, penis measuring between characters too long action scenes, too little breathing room in between it's especially bad in Resident Evil 2 which he wrote if not directed, but I really don't get the sense that the actual director, like, trimmed out stuff that would have made it less, you know, exhausting to watch. He'll under-explain important things to the point where you wonder how the movie happens despite them seeming to prevent it. He'll have smart characters, specialists sometimes. You could point to one of these guys and say, there's a man outstanding in his field. Will do stupid things, stupid characters will do smart things, characters will act on information that there's no way they have. They will extremely suddenly, hugely change their characterization, behavior, etc. He scores scenes with techno music that's A, bad, and B, doesn't fit the scenes. I mean, it's, it's one thing if at least, I've seen, I, I didn't write down an example, but there are movies where like the bad techno music kind of fits because the movie's trashy anyway. But no, it's it's like you're you're trying to watch an action movie and like your roommate is like you know refusing to turn down the volume on on the techno he's listening to. 
sometimes he com seems to completely understand and love the source material, but then other times he seems to not understand what makes it work. He gets crucial details completely wrong. You know, some of this is especially you you especially see in Alien vs. Predator, where like you know he'll swear up and down he's a huge fan of both creatures of the original movies, and I think it was Film Brain who pointed out that he actually does seem to try to have a similar pacing to like the first Alien movie. So it's it's not like suit moving super fast. I actually for a while I remember that movie as being over two hours. And then I check, it's like, it's 90 minutes or something, but it feels much longer because a huge chunk of it is moving really slowly because he thinks that that's important to making, you know, the alien creature work when, I mean, I realize some, you know, some people will say the following sacrilege. I think the alien resurrection works perfectly decently as an alien movie. And I would not say that that's a slow movie movie. You know, it works. It 100% works for the original movie. And certainly Aliens, I, I'm not sure I would call it slow, but it certainly builds for a, a good chunk of it. It it doesn't throw Aliens at you from right away. I guess the third one, I mean, it's not, it's not crazy fast-paced, certainly, but... Yeah, you know, Alien Resurrection works, and that one does keep to a much, much faster pace. So, I, I don't think anybody wanted a slow-paced Alien vs. Predator movie. Like, of course the first one's gonna be a grad, gonna have a gradual pace, because we're only l learning about the creature, you know. He made, the movie came out in 2004. There's, there's an entire generation of people who, you know, like, you know, some someone born around the time the first movie came out, you know, would have been eligible to vote for, like, seven years. We're gonna be okay. You don't have, you don't have to just, just keep moving. Anyway, but then other things of the movie he clearly doesn't understand at all. And just, yeah, anyway. He, you know, he'll he'll make a PG thirteen movie about stuff that should be R rated. Like it is absurd that his, you know, again I specify his because there are now there are two Alien vs Predator movies, and I'm not saying the second one's good, but it moves faster and it's R rated. The idea of making a PG thirteen movie featuring aliens who you might have heard burst out of the human body you know the the yeah and predators you know the ones who treat the human spine like you know a a vase or something it's it's just kind of you know look at what i have no, let's 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 do that PG thirteen. He, you know, he does have some fun with the R rating when he gets to work with it. He makes movies that probably should go direct to video, except for the production value and cast. Somehow he manages to keep attracting like huge talent, and then sometimes he'll completely waste them. Just yeah. Sometimes he'll have a goofy idea for how to show someone is cool, like in Soldier, where two super soldiers, to show off how good they are and stuff, run to see who runs the fast and climbs up a rope and, you know, sees who can hold on to the rope at the top for longer, you know, instead of fighting each other or something. Every so often he'll get a new bad idea, or occasionally a good one, but misuse it. Resident Evil 4 was shot with the same 3D cameras as Avatar to relatively little effect. Like, I think he might have thought that his movie would basically be, like, as good as Avatar. If, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying everything about that movie is perfect, but the visuals are incredible. And Resident Evil 4, like, yeah. some of the, some of the 3D for sure is, is pretty cool, but yeah. 
and yeah, for, for this movie, he got like a rig for turning over and rolling a car. So yeah, that gets overused. His movies were substantially better written before he started writing them himself. I I believe the first time he used yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure the first time he used handheld shaky cam was in Resident Evil 6, but in this movie he does it again. And and like let's see, frenetic editing. I forget hmm. He's always as far back you you can go all the way back to like, let's see, I guess Mortal Kombat. Uh, hmm. Mortal Kombat might not have frenetic editing, actually, now that I think about it. But there's parts of Event Horizon and Soldier that have frenetic editing. So, but I do think he did. He has gotten worse, and certainly, you know, like as you know, editing rigs have gotten better and better. Like today, you can, you know, if you so choose, you can have things moving ridiculously fast in a movie and you know, good filmmakers know that, you know, like, he'll act like, like a, a, a kid in a candy shop. He'll just, you know, ooh, I want that, I want that, and just, it keep, keeps going and going and going until it's, his movie is eventually just like, oh, come on, it's just like, it's a, it's an assault on your senses, you know, and he expects you to, return for the for the next one maybe even watch it again just yeah and and I, I mean yeah if I were still a teenager maybe I would say oh that's so cool but yeah now but but yeah you know Resident Evil 6 and this one he films in tight close-up with this handheld shaky cam and it's way too frequently like some sequences we are talking more than one cut per second. It's 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 ridiculous. He loves sequel baiting endings, including for movies he does not think should have sequels. And he'll be a really big fan of a certain element of a film or other piece of media and just grab it and recreate it in his own film, either with no explanation or ridiculous explanation, like how he puts the Dawn of the Dead remake zombie zombie suburb in Resident Evil 5 and how his Wesker sounds like Agent Smith and in his Resident Evil movies Miljovic is the only one who gets to do anything cool if other good guy characters try they'll fail and she has to pick up the slack I I don't remember if that happens let's see I what else has he put yeah I mean most of the movies that he writes or directs that she appears in. It's almost all Resident Evil movies. She is also in the Three Musketeers. I do not remember if... Oh, I mean, I, she, yeah, she's not a hero in that one. Anyway, I have to admit, when I read the book, I was a little surprised that her character was in the book. My, my lady, I think she's... You know, I honestly thought that he just felt like, oh, you know, you know what this movie about men who do fencing with it needs my hot wife dodging you know the kind of traps you maybe see today but not back then seriously i'm not making this up it's in the movie i hesitate to tell you to go see for yourself i what have you done to deserve that really and in the Resident Evil movies, outside of her considerable abilities, he writes and directs Mila Jovovich to be boring, which I'm pretty sure is considered a crime in most countries. Like ser seriously, if you've only watched, if you if you only know her from the movies that Paul makes, watch like she she can be so incredibly compelling. It's it's ridiculous it's it's a complete waste of her i i don't know like why does she put up with it i you know like yeah and a lot of like sometimes when he has black characters in his movies he has this tendency to make at least one of the black not all of them but at least one of them be like this ridiculous stereotype and you know we're it's 
it's supposed to be funny. We're supposed to laugh, but he pushes it way too far. It's it's like something out of a um an eighties movie or something. You know, c keeping in mind that like I'm f yeah, he hasn't. You know, the he started making movies in the nineties. You know, so he is way late on on that one. Just like that ship has gone way down the track of of where he just yeah and in general terrible comic relief with really corny jokes like at least in this movie i don't i don't know who took him aside and said if you leave those jokes in the movie people will walk out of the theater but i you know i'm i'm very grateful to that person you know i i i watched them on the blu-ray and out, outside of context, com completely removed from the movie itself. You know, it's like, uh, you know, you, you cringe until you feel like you might have pulled a muscle or something. But you do get over it. But yeah, if, if those jokes had been in the movie, holy crap. Now... A, a lot of the things in his movies are unmotivated. They're there because he likes them, not because they make sense to be in the film. And the following is mostly in his Resident Evil films, but also elsewhere. Someone will have to make it past, for example, a laser grid. He'll use wire work and just do the worst job at hiding. Like, there's literally... I suppose I shouldn't give away exactly which, but one of his Resident Evil movies... A character like jumps into the air to do attacks and literally like hangs in the air and like spins in the air and it's like nobody thinks that that was for real we can tell that that's why like I'm not saying every movie that has wire work has to hide it but the more obvious it is, like, un unless you're doing, like, that's that's the thing, you know. There are instances in the Matrix movies where characters will do something and we, if we, you know, if if we go outside of just, you know, if, if you're just in the movie, if you're enjoying it, you maybe don't think about it. But, you know, afterwards, if you think back to it, it's like, okay, that was probably why I work. But it's there to point out that the matrix is not the real world that you can do things in the matrix that you would never be able to do in the real world and he just has it in scenes that are supposed to be set in the real world and just because he's specific like the rest the first resident evil movie does tell you this is the real world you know the laws of physics apply there's a I, I personally in it is my opinion that every piece of fiction creates it own, its own world and it doesn't have to it has no responsibility to for, for that world to be the same as the the real world or as it's you know as other entries in the franchise or anything as long as it can explain why why it's different if it's part of the franchise or anything you know but but he specifically like there there are there are very clear indications in at least the first Resident Evil movie okay no this is this is basically the real world like there's you know there's stuff that's like a little out there but it's it's basically set in the real world anyway He'll bring up incredibly interesting and intelligent sci-fi ideas and do nothing with them. I suppose I won't give away exactly what... Okay. Spoiler. Until until you see Lone My Index Finger. Spoiler for Resident Evil 5, the movie. Cloning and real-world simulations. No more spoilers for the time being. And in, in Death Race... In action scenes, I actually I forgot this until I rewatched my own video on the movie. In action scenes, you can't tell how well anyone is doing at the race, how far they are from the finish line, etc. And it's like, why do you think we're watching a race movie? It is literally that's what we're there to see. If we just want to watch a movie with cars and violence, there's plenty of those. 
but like movies that are specifically about you know car races we want to be able to tell how well people are doing in the race it's just wow he'll have ridiculously convoluted plots and sometimes the movie will move so fast that you basically only really understand the plot when you're after you've watched the entire movie and you're trying to think back and trying to piece everything together he'll skip some of the best and most interesting world building he will promise really cool concepts like Resident Evil and Mortal Kombat and then not deliver you know on yeah deliver much at all on what we expect from that concept like there are way too few zombies in the first Resident Evil movie there's way too little fighting in Mortal Kombat in, in his Mortal Kombat movie, you know, I, I don't think very highly of Annihilation. I haven't watched the new one, so I can't comment. Annihilation is garbage, but at least there's a lot of fighting in it. And, you know, if you watch the first one, like, there's so many bits where you think, oh, there's, there's going to be a fight now. And then there just isn't. And it's like, what, what do you think we're watching for? Like, you can do this well, you know, that for his Mortal Kombat movie, he took some inspiration from, I want to say it's called Enter the Dragon, the Bruce Lee masterpiece, which, you know, in case, if you, I just, I want to, I want to underline in case you haven't watched it, which you should, if you like martial arts movies, you should definitely watch Enter the Dragon. That movie has a lot of fighting, you know, that, that, isn't a movie that's constantly finding excuses for characters not to fight. That has a lot of fighting, and it's also really, like, you, you get into the emotion of it, and he tries to get that, but, yeah. And, yeah, I, you know, that made me guess that this movie would have way too little monster hunting, and, yeah, I mean, it's it's the title. It's, it's why people are watching the movie, you know, I, I mean... I don't know, I guess Monster Fleeing isn't as captivating of a title. Hiding from monsters. Stuck in a world with monsters. Not good at fighting yet. All I got was this lousy t-shirt. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll workshop it later. And he won't necessarily think about if something should have happened before he shows it in the movie. Because he wants to show it, and he wants it to happen at that particular point in the movie. He loves underground facilities with high-tech security. He especially loves making them very neatly designed, making maybe having a unique visual appearance, like a room shaped like the umbrella symbol. He uses over-stylized transitions, like a heat vision camera gradually zooming in on a 3D map of a facility, ending up showing the actual room and in like, you know, regular color. One of the things I really love about the umbrella symbol shaped room is I don't think many of the characters in that movie even realize that it's umbrella shaped. Like, who is this for, Paul? Who did you do this for? Like, we get to see it because he does the, look at what I can make the camera do. So this this is the room, you know, and we've got the camera just normally in the room, and then we pull out the camera so you can see the shape of the room. Oh, it's so cool. And it's just like <laughs> who would bother to do this? <laughs> like, don't get me wrong. The architects, they were high fiving each other all over the place. Like they were like, this is gonna be so awesome. But nobody nobody looks like you I don't know if you could even really see it from just look from inside the room. You could see if you're above the room, sure, but nobody's gonna be a, above the room. It's you're you're supposed to be either inside of the room or like right outside. But you're not supposed to be above looking down. So just yeah. When there are creatures in his movies, it'll frequently have more or less of them appear in one place than makes sense. Maybe have them appear in a place that doesn't make sense for them to be at all, or in a state that doesn't make sense. You know, some of the zombies in the first Resident Evil movie look like they've been dead for considerably longer. Like, some of them have started decomposing, and it's like, we were, 
specifically told that it's only been a few hours. Like, literally, characters specify it's only been a few hours, but we're going, you know, yeah. Even characters that he wants us to like will sometimes do incredibly spiteful things. That is very much the case. There are several instances of that in this one. His movies pass right through you. It doesn't take an eternity, except for a couple of them, but it's not especially pleasant or something you feel like doing again anytime soon. And he'll often make at least one third of the movie and frequently the last third really, really fun, and you wonder why that couldn't have been the whole movie that was that fun. And I also... Yeah, I, I also noted some... some things that, you know, that, that are frequent problems when... you know, when, when a movie is an adaptation of a... you know, of a PC or console game. Uh, yeah, video game and a video game movie is what I'll be referring to them from now on. I I haven't watched every single video game movie ever made because I don't hate myself. The only good ones I've seen are Press Start, Press Start One, and Press Start Two. I've heard that Detective Pikachu is good. I can see that being true. Some have said so is Sonic. Now that. That goes beyond what I could possibly imagine. So anyway, problems with video game movies. Too little of the game stuff. Game stuff without explaining or taking it out of the game's context to where it doesn't work or not as well. Scenes that simulate the experience of playing the game but without emotional engagement. Stuff that's simple and we're, we've kind of accepted, you know, the... Yeah, in we we've accepted then the game it's simple made complex or vice versa stuff that's complex in the game made simple in both cases because the people making the movie either are ashamed of the video game roots or they think viewers who haven't played the game won't get it without the filmmakers changing it. The movie may yeah movies like this are sometimes made by people who don't really care about the game maybe don't understand it maybe even are resentful for working on something. That was based on a video game. The movie will attempt to connect the game world with the real world when, you know, the game is just kind of set in its own world and it isn't supposed to have any connection to the real world. So it ends up really awkward and most fans of the game don't care about a connection to the real It's It's escapism. It's supposed to be set in a different world a lot of the time. So it's really only for people going into the adaptation without knowing the original, and usually the adaptation leaves them confused anyway. And yes, this is very much a, a case where, yeah, I already mentioned about the, the connection between the real world and the world that these games are set in. And let's see. I saw at least one critic say that this is the worst Paul W. Anderson film out of all of them. I would definitely say it is one of the most headache-inducing. I, I will admit I've only watched Resident Evil 6 once, and that was, I guess by now, about five years ago. So I can't directly compare, but I remember that one as being very headache-inducing as well. I suppose overall that one is probably at least a little bit worse, a little, at least a little bit more like overly, like it's just it's it's in too much of a hurry, throwing too many things at you. So the the very start of this movie is set in the new world, and we get just this brief glimpse of what it's like to be in the new world and then it goes back to our world and you know it, it doesn't take forever before it gets to that that is <laughs> that is some, some something he will sometimes do spend way too long before delivering on the thing that we're there to see but no fairly early in this movie they go to the new world and from then on out, you know, there is usually monsters, 
monster hunters and or monster hunters hunting monsters. So, yeah, for for it does it does okay at at delivering that. I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it fits with what came before. I suppose I am largely happy with how the movie ends. It doesn't really have Deus Ex Machina. Let's see, the... the Convenient writing. There is some convenient writing. Now, it does have a, I guess not post credit scene, but mid credit scene. And you don't have to sit all the way through the end credits, just the first chunk of it. You know, what, there's, there's only the one. Once you've seen one, you can just, you know, you don't have to keep watching after that. I wouldn't really say that the movie loses your interest along the way. Some parts of it are more enjoyable to watch than others. And if if you really, really badly want to get at least some live action, you know, monster hunting, if, if you want to see some of the stuff that's in the game, I would say the movie does deliver on uh, there's not a huge amount of it in the movie, but what there is is legitimately decently handled. Like, once again, I haven't played the game, so I can't say for sure, but I have, you know, I watched some reviews by people who are big fans of the games. They were frustrated with the movie, understandably. And I watched a little bit of stuff on the game itself. And, and yeah, you know, like, as a brief, yeah. In the game, you basically, you hunt a, you know, small or medium-sized monster. Once you've killed it, you use some of the, the like, ah, what's it called? You take something from its its body, and you use that to hunt a larger monster. And, yeah, rinse and repeat. And, yeah, the movie does have that. There are, in fact, they, they kill more than one monster. And on at least one occasion, they take something from a monster they've killed to use to kill another monster. And, yeah, you know, like... You can tell he he cares about he he did legitimately want to put that kind of thing into the movie and it's just like you wonder why why couldn't the whole movie have been that like anyway and it also does decent on like. You know, I, I don't know if all of the weapons they use in this are actually from the games, but I've seen videos where they sh where they compare, you know, so I know that at least some of them are. And apparently, like, it actually does have, like, some of them have abilities that they have in the game. And, and again, like, the movie doesn't explain, it just, it notes that it's there, and that we wouldn't expect it to be there, but it doesn't at all explain it. And it's, I, again, I'm not saying it has to, but if you're going to do that, then why would you start, you know, why, why would the, you know, why, why even bother connecting the game, to the, yeah, the game's world, the new world, to our world? Why not just set it only within the new world. You know, I, I doubt there's a single fan of the video game out there who's like, ah, oh, you know, it's really, oh, it's so fun. It's so fun to hunt monsters. I really love, you know, hunting monsters and crafting to hunt other monsters. 
But you know what I would really love? If some characters from the real world could only be transported into the game's world and then screw around for a really long time without hunting monsters. That, that's exactly what, you know, I, I, I don't think there's a single person who, yeah. Now, this is one of those kinds of movies where it simply isn't going to tell you all that much about the characters. So, yeah, if that means you can't get into th that kind of movie, I'm afraid this is a movie you won't be able to get into. And I do think this movie would have been better if it had at least a little bit more. And it's again, like, I know Anderson knows how to do it because I... I'm not necessarily saying that I did care while watching his Mortal Kombat movie, but I could tell that he meant for me to care. And maybe, you know, maybe in part it, it is that the backstory for that apparently came from the actual games, as far as I understand. I, I've i played a little bit of Mortal Kombat, but it's not really, you know, Tekken is my fighting game series. Now... Yeah, see, there are times in the movie where you do feel some empathy for some of the characters. There are definitely times where you really hate the characters, but unfortunately, that is sometimes with the same characters. So, yeah. And... Yeah, so I already mentioned Mel Yolovich. Yeah, U.S. Army Ranger, member of a United Nations military team. And Tony Ja as Hunter, one of, yeah, a, a highly skilled warrior fighting against, fighting giant monsters. So at least one of the leads actually is Asian since, you know, the games were made by Japanese developers. He is Thai, so it's not quite the same, but, you know. And I, I don't know if in the games, if the characters are... I, I could imagine the ones released in America, probably the characters speak English, but... You know, I mean... If, if you just want the characters to be American, just, you know, adapt an American game. Anyway. He's got some Hawkeye-style trick arrows. He is in a ridiculously incredible shot. And he and Artemis spend a significant amount of time together, and the two characters cannot talk to each other. They don't speak the same language. So a lot has to be communicated with gestures, and in behind the scenes, he and Mila expressed that they wanted there to be as much and as funny, funny moments between them, so they improvised a lot, and... It's, it's okay. I, I don't know that I would say that it was all that funny, but they look like they're having fun, and that, I, I like that. I like when the, yeah. And the fact that he doesn't speak English does lead to the movie sometimes treating him like he's unintelligent, which is, sadly, a bit of a trope. And it's completely unnecessary, because at other times, the movie makes it completely clear he is fiercely intelligent. Like, he... He is very aware of the world around him, and he's really good at maneuvering it. But in a lot of American movies, if you don't speak English, the, the movie kind of treats you like you are actually, yeah, just unintelligent. I don't think I'm going to go too much into the other characters. I... I think I'll just say you don't care that much about them. And the movie is focused on Artemis and the Hunter, so... Yeah. I think some of them do give pretty decent performances, and it was kind of fun. Like, one of them is played by Josh Hellman, who... The only other thing I've seen him in are the X-Men prequel movies, you know, where he plays the the young... Colonel Stryker, you know, who 
yeah, if you if you know very much about Wolverine, you know why Wolverine isn't the biggest fan of Colonel Stryker, and yeah, like he plays his character in this distinctly different from that, and I'm pretty sure both of them are supposed to be American, so but but yeah, he and and military for that matter, so you know, you, you could you could see how he might just play it the exact same. And T.I. is in this, and he's very different. I have to admit, I don't think I've seen him in anything other than this and then, you know, the, the I guess I'll just say the MCU. And he's very different. So, yeah. I suppose I will just say Ron Perlman is in this, and just, yeah, he's he's having a good time. And we have a good time watching him have a good time. I don't think I've ever, ever watched a movie and been like, you know, the movie's pretty good, but a mm, little bit too much Ron Perlman. I, I, I feel like they should have called it a day and been like, eh, a little, little less Ron Perlman. We, we, you know, people are going to be, get tired of him eventually. No, no, this is, this is not a thing. You know, he's, he's just... I, I forget if I've talked about this on camera before, but like, I, I, I forget the director's name, but he directed, I suppose one of the most, you know, if, if you're American, one of the movies he's made that you know the best is Enemy at the Gates, you know, with, with several very bankable stars. And then he also directed The Name of the Rose. Or was it in the name of the... something like that. And The Quest for Fire. And Ron Perlman is in all three of those movies. And I think... If, if, I, if I understand it correctly, basically the director really, really likes working with Ron Perlman. So he finds a way to put him in... Like, these are three incredibly different movies. You know, as, a, as a, just a real, real quick... Enemy at the Gates is about a Nazi sniper and a Soviet sniper trying to take each other out during World War II in the name of the Rose is about I, f I forget which century it's set in but like I'm almost certain it's not present day I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a you know what I might be wrong about that but anyway it is the no, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a it's a couple of hundred years ago, and it's about like Sean Connery, R.I.P. has been requested to visit this like I want to say it's a monastery because there has been a death there, and he's there to investigate. It's a murder mystery, and the quest for fire is about I I always get these wrong. I want to say Neanderthal? Or, or, you know, our ancestors, or maybe just really early humans. You know, they, they, they have fire, and then they lose fire, and they need fire. You know, it, it cooks the food, it keeps them warm, keeps away dangerous animals. They're gonna need more fire, so Ron Perlman and two other Neanderthals are... Uh, that sounded distinctly like I just called the actor. The actor is not a Neanderthal. He's He plays one on TV. But, yeah, they go out and, and try to find more fire so they can return to their tribe with more fire. These are three incredibly different movies, but they're directed by the same guy, and uh, Ron Perlman appears in all three, and he is glorious in all three. Like, e even if you don't think these concepts sound that interesting, if you're a fan of Ron Perlman, I would say they're, all three of them are worth watching at least once, just for the Perlman. Just, just for the Perlman. Now, I think that is pretty much all I'm going to say about the characters. So, the <laughs> the dialogue. So, K 
characterization. I, I wish I could say that it conveyed characterization well, but I don't know if Paul W. Sanderson is aware that you can be in the military and have a personality other than I'm in the military, because I'm not sure I've seen him do that. I, I, I'm not sure I can think of a single movie where someone who is in the military actually has a personality. They're, they're, pa they're basically just defined by that. And, and yeah, which makes the fact that there's like half a dozen military people in this movie, you know, that gets kind of old. <laughs> Artemis is apparently married. On more than one occasion, she will, like, reach into a pocket and get out, or necklace, I forget exactly where she has it, but, you know, she grabs out this, this wedding ring, and she looks at it, and, like, on the inside, it says, for, forever, or so, something like that. And she'll be like, I'm coming home to you. And that's basically it, like, we have no idea. Like... <laughs> I don't know if they've been married for a year, ten years. I don't know if they have kids together. I don't know. Like, for all, I, I can't guarantee that she isn't like, I'm coming home to you and I'm going to kick your ass because you cheated on me, you dirtbag. I don't know. I doubt it. But it would make the movie more interesting. It would make her character more interesting. She's just, you know, she, she wants to go home. She wants to get from the new world back to our world so she can go home to the person she's married to, which, I mean, the movie's fairly heteronormative, so I'm going to go ahead and assume that it's a guy, but for all I know, she's just, like, if the movie would be a million times more interesting if it was, like, you know, yeah, let's say that she's lesbian or bisexual and she married a woman and it's the first time anyone in her family has married a woman and for a while her parents didn't talk to her but eventually they were like okay you know what this is ridiculous we want to have a relationship with you still you know they didn't show up to the wedding but they like they ended up giving them a belated wedding present wedding gift I forget what that's called yeah and and this you know think about how much more compelling the movie would be but no she's just she's married and she wants to go home to the person she's married to and that's it and and like some of the characters don't even have that like they're basically just that like they're there because anderson wanted someone there who could fire a gun and and like be attacked by monsters and that's basically it like you know if if they were if this was a world where the idea of a some someone's like action figure suddenly gaining sentience and not caring about having gained sentience but just wanting to run around and shoot at things then th the characters might actually be that it, again i'm i'm i got to stop trying to make this movie more interesting than it actually is it does i I suppose it does do a, an okay job of not having excessive exposition, but again, there's not, you know, like I quoted Angry Joe pointing out, there's not that, there's really not that much dialogue. Like, the two most heavily featured characters don't speak each other's language. So, you know, I'm not, I, I wouldn't really say that the dialogue is quotable or memorable. Like, there are 11 entries in the IMDb quote section, which for such a recent movie, so like, you know, I, I featuring such, such well-known, like, you know, I already mentioned like TI and yeah, so some of the others, you know, big names, Tony John, I, I have to admit, I haven't watched that much, but I, I hear he's a really big deal. And, and I can understand why. I'd watch more with him, honestly. But only 11. That's, that kind of gives you an idea of A, not much dialogue. B, the dialogue is not very good. You know, it's, I, I would say all 11 of them are, are bad.
Like they are not. Like I, I think, I think it's intentional that IMDb doesn't call it good quotes. It calls it memorable because memorable is not automatically a positive. Memorable can be a negative term, and I think sometimes it's just if you remember a terrible line from this, please put it in. You know. Uh, some some months ago, I, I did a video on the movie, I can't believe I'm blanking on, Blue Sunshine? I want to say it's called Blue Sunshine, directed by the same director as Squirm, which you might know from MST3K. I maintain that overall that movie is good, but there's, there's this, there's this one exchange where this character is talking about, like, I'm, I think I'm losing my mind, like, things are just getting worse and worse, and another character says, have some coffee. <laughs> and someone made sure to add that to the memorable quotes, and I think it might actually be, like, I, th I think there's maybe one or two other quotes in the memorable quote section, and this is a movie full of dialogue, like, there's, there's a ton of, of, like, so, so you could easily, you could have a lot of, of entries in there, but there are barely any. And the, you know, I, I think a lot of people, a lot of people were disappointed by the movie, so they didn't bother writing in any. And some people just didn't think the movie was memorable enough to put anything in. But that bit was like, I think a lot of people really cracked up at, at that. And yeah. So yeah, characterization, not a lot of it. It's, it's, I, I think it's a, a good way to deliver, to, to handle characterization is to show the characters in tremendously varied circumstances. So, you know, we get, we see what they're like when things are going well, you know, because some, like, a character might be bitter even when things are going well. That tells you okay, this is a character who's just in general bitter. If the first time you see the bitter character, things are going bad, or you never see things going well for them, you just assume, oh, well, no wonder they're bitter. Everything keeps going wrong for them, you know. And and some bitter characters might actually be relieved when things go badly, because they're like, huh, finally, this is what I've been waiting for. I, I kept waiting for things to go bad, you know. And this movie does show some of the characters in tremendously varied circumstances, and it kind of makes the characterization worse, not better. Because they're just really inconsistent. Like like I mentioned, his characters will sometimes be ridiculously inconsistent. Like, I, I'm pretty sure we're supposed to care about Artemis and Hunter, the, the hunter. And I don't, like, some of the things they do are just so petty and small. And it's just, like why did you put this in the movie because it didn't he didn't have to he went out of his way to make sure they did things that were petty and small and just like it it keeps it as it, it keeps us at arm's length from the character it means we don't like yeah it's just yeah now I will say, I think if the, you know, if you didn't already care about the video game, I think there is a chance that watching this will get you to care. I already mentioned that I haven't played them, but the moment that I heard, like, you know, I, the first time I heard that this was even, actually, yeah, I think I did see that, the, you know, for several years before it came out, it was listed on IMDb as announced. You know, I, th I think possibly, yeah, I think when Resident Evil 6 came out, I could, I, you know, it, this was listed as announced, as him direct writing and directing it. So, I've, you know, I've had years to adjust to the idea that a movie called Monster Hunter was coming out, and... Paul W. Anderson was a big fan of the games, and yeah, you know, I've watched a little bit of, like, 
yeah, there is uh, what's it called? Not not really let's plays, but just yeah, you know, clips, stuff stuff people thought was really cool about the games and such. Girlfriend reviews did like a video or two on on these and yeah, you know, in general a good channel. So I didn't, there's, there wasn't a lot in this movie that I hadn't seen a clip of or had heard was in the games, you know. I wouldn't rule out playing them. I, I think there's a chance that that will happen. Currently I have a, a pretty significant backlog of video games. I'm not looking for any new ones. But yeah, it looks like it's fun. You know, if if I understand correctly, they're like open world, and yeah, you run around killing monsters, crafting things for new monster killing. Yeah, you know, <laughs> Japanese video game developers are incredibly talented. You know, they they also gave us Resident Evil, which I'll admit, you know, I only dipped my toe into that franchise, but I was pretty. I played all of the second one. I played the demo of the third one, and I played. Am I really gonna? I'm gonna. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, yeah. I played all of Resident Evil Survivor multiple times on purpose. Yeah. I don't know. I I I had the the thing where you plug in the thing and you're holding like a, a toy gun and you can point to the point at the the screen and shoot the zombies directly. It was fun, you know. It wasn't necessary. It was fun. And, yeah, you know, I, I like those. I like those two games a lot. And, yeah, just in general, it's just, they're, they're so talented. They're so good at making video games. Yeah, I could definitely see myself playing this. Anyway, what I was, yeah, to, to I think if, if you go into this, knowing nothing about it like if you go into this not even knowing there's a video game you're probably gonna leave it wanting to play the video game there's a pretty good chance I would say that when you leave you're gonna like you might not even like the movie that much but you're gonna be like okay the, that that looks like fun though cinematography so the cinematography the DP is Glenn McPherson who was also DP on Resident Evil 6, 5, and 4. And he was also the DP on Pompeii, Three Musketeers, the, the Paul W. Anderson one. Oh, right, yeah, the, the 2008 Rambo movie. And Romeo Must Die, and, and others, but those are the ones that I've watched. So, he and Paul Davis Anderson have history, and, yeah, like, I'm not that surprised that this is someone that he's worked with before, because the guy gives him, Glenn gave him exactly 100% what he wanted. If, if, you know, compare this to Resident Evil 6, this is clearly what he wants now. This is, you know, we are, we are cursed, those of us who choose to watch his movies willingly. Because this is, or for that matter, those who get forced into it. But, yeah, his movies are going to be like this until he realizes how bad it is. Because he doesn't, he, it's not accidental. You know, he he gets what he wants. He, I, he seems to be happy with how the things come out. But, yeah, so... Handheld doesn't have to be bad, you know. Born the born supremacy, the born ultimatum. You know the the. Um, yeah, I suppose those are, especially ones where it worked really well. But then there's also, you know, the first Hunger Games movie. There's Cloverfield, the Taken sequels, the Blair Witch Project. I realize that the Blair Witch Project, it's intentional, but it's still incredibly obnoxious. But, yeah, the, the, the handheld here is... Wow.
So let's see. Yeah, I, I wrote down a few things to note. You know, is the for for something you typically want from cinematography, is it easy to follow when something suddenly happens like action scenes? Very frequently no. Like the the it'll be so overpowering. I think if the camera isn't moving like crazy, it's usually because it's letting us take in a CG shot. Otherwise, and, and sometimes even during those, it'll still be, yeah. Does the movie have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm? I suppose it does decent at that. When, when, the, when a scene is supposed to be calm, it's not, like, flying all over the place. Are there unnecessary shots? I... Not really, I don't think. No. But, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and quote some fellow critics here. They say that the cinematography is vivid, noteworthy, high production value, gorgeous, amazing. Yeah, this is another one. Aided by cinematographer Glenn McPherson, Resident Evil 4 through 6, Trick or Treat, Anderson capably captures the sheer scope of these savages thanks to a surplus of wide shots that effectively exhibit the titanic threat they pose to our heroes in their continual clashes. At times the camera was so jumpy that my girlfriend actually got motion sick, and even I, who is rarely affected by stuff like that, got a slight headache. Someone really needed to take those drones away from Anderson, who seems to be like a kid in a candy store when it comes to sweeping his camera around without a second thought. The camera skits around like a racehorse with an ice cube up its butt. This movie suffers from the painful rapid-fire editing and shaky camera garbage that plagues Paul Dibier's Anderson works, particularly the final chapter of the Resident Evil movie series. And yeah, this this person gave it a 3 out of 10. I like the concept, but the execution is poor and detracts from the idea. Wes, go back and what? Wes. I don't know if this person thinks that it's Wes Anderson or it's just... That's... But it, yeah, he wrote W-E-S, so... Yeah, maybe it's a... Maybe it's a... Intended as a nickname for W-S. Anyway. Go back and watch Resident Evil, mate. Go and see how you made a great movie and how to hold a flipping camera and how to edit scenes together. Please do us a favor. Bouncy camera work. This isn't to say I despise the look of the film. The more granular Anderson, DP, Glenn, McPherson get with the camera, the more I can appreciate the visceral survival aesthetic that Anderson is going for. This is, after all, a survival action-adventure film at its core. It should feel tactile, and it does when the camera is getting as close as it possibly can to real-life objects, but that doesn't help action sequences, which rely on the grand scale of the world's creatures to function effectively. At times, Monster Hunter feels like an extended VFX reel, complete with repetitive directorial choices, such as camera swirling and drone shots from up on high. The design mirrors that of a game and how it follows the camera movement. The sheer scale is where this is at its most effective, with the camera pulled back a really long way, showing the audience just how gigantic the monsters here are, and with the humans reduced to tiny specks, typically hightailing it in the opposite direction. It's a glorious rush of spectacle. It is, it, it's very impressive. As mentioned earlier, I like the look of the monsters whenever the camera is moving all over the goddamn place. The first half of the film plays like Peter Berg's Lone Survivor. When the camera stops long enough for us to actually take any of Mila's performance in. And... The film's overall visual aesthetic is a confused and derivative hodgepodge, and audience enjoyment will depend upon their affection for the oversaturated genre 2.5 out of 5 and the editing which was handled by Doobie White who also the only other things I've seen 
that they edited were Resident Evil 6, The Darkest Hour, which, where they went uncredited, and it's the 2011 one. It's it's the it's the schlock one. It's not the. I want to say. Churchill. It's not the Churchill Darkest Hour. It's it's the it's the Invisible Aliens, Darkest Hour. And Gamer, and oh boy, yeah, yeah. I'm not surprised that the the um, Neville Dean Taylor duo. I am a little surprised that he only edited one of their movies, because this is this is the kind of editing that they really really like. So again, I wrote down a few rules of good editing for, for like action scenes and such. Does the editing keep it easy to follow fast moving scenes like action scenes? I mean occasionally, you know, sometimes for the when when yeah, when a really big monster is moving, it can sometimes does it keep more calm when that is called for? Yeah, yeah. In in scenes that aren't action, yeah. Are there scenes that should be cut, moved in the overall structure, trimmed down, or increased in length? There are definitely a couple of things that could have been trimmed, yeah. Yeah, this, this movie was edited by someone with ADHD for people with ADHD. Now... Yeah, rapidly, right, quoting fellow critics here, the, yeah, rapidly edited action scenes. The movie seems like it could have been good, but it was destroyed in editing and post-production. The editing is incredibly bad, choppy editing. Editor Doobie White seems to be channel channeling Michael Bay at his most ADHD in some of the film's key battle moments, taking away enjoyment when we can't even tell who is doing what or what is happening to them? Erratic editing that had negatively affected the overall perspective. Due to wildly rapid succession of edits at times, it barely makes sense of what is actually happening. Utterly appalling preference coming from whoever decided to adopt such detestable filmmaking. Yeah, I mean that is he, he's he's past his everything should be slow motion phase the you know which if you've watched Resident Evil 4 you know what I'm talking about. And I think yeah, and the fifth one also has way too much you know slow motion, but he is now in his everything should be shaky cam close-ups and frenetically edited phase. Because when you go back and watch some of his early movies, he didn't always have this terrible, terrible... What's it called? Yeah. He only got this idea when... Because even, even, like, let's see, before Resident Evil 6, he directed Pompeii. I'm almost certain that one wasn't shaky cam. Dreadful editing migraine-inducing jump cuts of the last RE movie. Three-frame edits so you can't see what's going on during the fights. Paul W. Anderson manages to ruin proceedings with his annoying style of editing. Poor editing. I just wish director Paul W. Anderson would relax with the quick cut editing and give us a movie that we could actually watch without feeling nauseous. Messy editing. The film jumps from short moving action scene to the next. This only makes the movie more difficult to follow. And because the movie is in 3D, this can lead to headaches for some people. They can also use a lot of unnecessary slow motion effects to convey the movie more exciting, but unfortunately, slow motion only makes the movie unnecessarily long. Was there a lot of slow? Wow. 
See, the movie already is leaving my memory. Yeah, you know what? Fair enough. Maybe there is a lot of slow motion in this one as well. I, I legitimately don't remember now. Too many rapid cuts. A poor editing and... Doobie White, having worked with Anderson on Resident Evil Final Chapter, gets his conviction that no shot should last more than three seconds. There's a sequence of the duo walking across the desert that lasts all of four seconds, and it feels like Omar Sharif's entrance in Lawrence of Arabia. It's impossible to get bored. Jittery editing. Anderson fails to make good use of Tony Ja in this movie. Despite being an accomplished martial artist, Anderson and his editor, Doobie White, managed to do the impossible by making him look like a guy who doesn't know how to fight well. The fight scenes are all incomprehensible with the annoying overly edited approach. Sloppy editing. You know that editing tick Sam Raimi uses? The one where he rapidly cuts between someone arming themselves piece by piece, maybe putting on a suit? That's Monster Hunter. All of Monster Hunter. If dialed up, Monster Hunter's average shot length is likely 0 0.6 seconds. It appreciates nothing, no matter how wide the vistas are or how grand the digital effects want to look. In casting Tony Jaa, noted for his spectacular long cut fight sequences, scenes, the creative team obliterates his screen talents. Impatient edit edits, messily edited, Frenetic editing and Monster Hunter's main issue is that it has no sense of temporality. The editing is unbelievably jumpy, barely giving our minds eyes any time at all to marinate on Anderson's overcrowded frames. rushed and choppy editing. The frantic quick cuts make some action scenes borderline indecipherable. Erratic editing. Paul, what's subtext? Anderson is the poster boy for poor editing, and this movie is no exception. Tony Scott and Transformers Man want him to hold their beers, but Paul who sucks Anderson rejects them with a plum. One cut per second editing style. Too manic. What makes this film hard to follow is the fact that it is edited and presented as if there are three separate films in one. Yeah, that's a good point. I had actually forgotten about that, but that is very, very true. The movie was edited by a blender that somehow gained sentience. And, yeah, the editing is a nightmare. Overly edited action scenes, frustrating use of slow motion. And a general assault on the senses. Yeah. 
Some of the battle sequences cut by editor Doogie White gave this viewer whiplash. The Blu-ray comes with, I think it's two deleted scenes, but it might be three, and there are these beyond terrible jokes that I mentioned earlier. Like, if you thought the ones from the original Predator movie were bad, this movie says, hold my beer, and I'm really glad they were cut. I just wish they kept cutting them. The special effects can be pretty good, and certainly... You know, fans will like that they do include, like, some of the, you know, some, some very recognizable creatures from the games. And if I understand correctly, they have, this, they have some of the same attributes as well. So, you know, the, the characters hunting in the movie have to approach them similarly to how players playing the game, games, approach them. And if I understand correctly, they did come up with some new designs or creatures and such. And yeah. They the the effects are legitimately good and that's not always something you can get you can depend on getting from a Paul W. Anderson movie. The stunts are good, but it's hard to appreciate because of the filming and editing. And some of the, yeah, so the, the, it was filmed in, let's see, South Africa. Yeah, and, and there are some interesting sets and settings in the film. Oh, that's right. They actually filmed it back in 2018. I guess I guess it's because of corona that it that it took until 2020 to get it cuz post production itself shouldn't take that long unless they were late in getting started on the on the effects work maybe but yeah it was probably corona That brings us to the action. As much fun as it can be to watch Milovich in action scenes when she is OP, you know, some really fun examples of her in action scenes is when she's much closer to being a regular human being with, you know, good training maybe, but not, you know, like superhuman. In this, like, she's not really superhuman. She has some, or not from right away but she gets access to some of the tools of the trade of the of the games and that obviously gives her a bit of a an edge but other than that yeah i they they do a decent job in this of like you know she's a ranger so she has access to some heavy duty weaponry but she's not superhuman which i got to admit i i think i had I was going to say I had forgotten, but in my defense, I think this might be the first time that Paul W. Zanderson has directed Mila Jovovich, or written her for that matter, in a movie where she wasn't superhuman because of, like, because, you know, it's not, yeah, in, in the... in the Resident Evil movies, there's, like, training and experiments and such, and... I'm not sure if there's supposed to be an explanation in the, what's it called, um, Three Musketeers movie, but certainly there are things about her that are basically like superhuman. But yeah, the, the action definitely can be fun. Like, it's, you know, you gotta get past the hurdle of the editing, and I, I don't blame anyone who doesn't, and I don't think we should have to, but yeah, there's... You know, the, the the fact that you have military people in a world with monsters, there are some, some cool sequences. You know, they, they get some cool stuff out of that. And yeah, you know, you have chases on foot and in vehicles, 
physical fights, including martial arts, shooting, including shooting while in vehicles, use of superpowered items, equipment, and yeah, there's there's a grappling hook, and it's it's kind of fun, you know that that is some. Occasionally, Paul can have some some fun with you know. There's there's some repelling in resident in. I guess I won't give away exactly which, but grappling hook and repelling in some of the Resident Evil films. I I love grappling hooks in games. You know the the Just Cause games. I I love games one, two, and three. I haven't played four yet, but again. It's literally the the reason I haven't played Just Cause Four, as I record this video, is because of Carpal Tunnel. That's literally the only reason. And there's some horror stuff. I guess I think I'll just limit to saying there's some there's some body horror, and it is quite effective. It you know, it's it's pushing the PG-13 rating, and yeah, like if if that's the kind of thing you think you might enjoy, yeah, you'll you'll very likely enjoy it in this. I'm trying to figure out a good way to sit from my back. Okay, let's see. So, So, the, the music is handled by Paul Haslinger, Haslinger, something like that, who also handled Resident Evil 6, The Three Musketeers, with Paul and Mila, Underworld, Rise of the Lycans, Death Race, Crank, Underworld, and Crazy Beautiful, and, and others, but those are the ones that I've watched. So, he and Paul Lewis Anderson have a history. And he's used to big, dumb action movies. I have to admit, I did not notice the music that much, but that is... I'm, I'm not that great at noticing it. I, I think it was decent enough. There's some really solid sound design, like some, some of the props for this movie, like... You know, it's it's not something that exists in the real world. It's not something that would exist in the real world, and they do a good job on the on the sound design. You know, yeah, props, creatures, various. You know, it it is. Try to, if if you try to watch, a scene that has like a creature, if you mute it and you only look at the effect, it's much less effective. The, the sound does a huge part of the... Yeah, and, and in fact, if, if you watch a creature feature and you're like, ah, oh, these, these are pretty decent effects, and you, you feel like, okay, it could be more compelling, the, 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 the creatures could be cooler, but I can't quite tell why it might be that the sound design for them is not that good. The humor, I think I've already covered now yeah so as far as tone goes several critics point out that it's you know it's afraid to go full camp and have fun with itself it's too it takes itself too seriously to enjoy its campiness but it's too campy to be considered a serious film yeah, it's it's too bad. I feel like if the movie, I I agree. If the movie just went completely campy, it it would be way more fun. So the yeah, the pacing is uneven. You know, like there's there's that thing of how it feels like it's multiple different movies in one, and yeah, without end credits, it's an hour. 32 and a half minutes long and with them it's an hour and 43 minutes long so yeah that's let's see 10 and a half minutes that's nothing but end credits and yeah but yeah that's the th you know he's he's gotten pretty decent at making sure the movies are around 90 minutes because the kinds of things that he does in his movies 
it gets to be pretty unbearable if you try to watch more than 90 minutes in a single sitting. Is it worth the investment of time? I think if you just really badly want a live action adaptation of the games, or if the, the concept appeals to you, if, if you, like me, just can't help but watch Paul W. Sanderson movies, it's worth it, but otherwise probably not, no. I suppose... I I think it is around the right length. I do think that the story could have been evened out better. Now... The best element of the movie, Anderson does manage to keep things unpredictable and there was some pretty cool stuff. Worst aspects, you know, yeah, Anderson's various weaknesses. Yeah, if, if I had to point to one specific thing, it's the cinematography, editing, or possibly both. I mean, the... the the two of them combined is a big problem, yeah. Now, yeah, and the thing I was most worried about were, you know, his usual weaknesses, and yeah, the movie lived down to my expectations, and I was most looking forward to some of Anderson's usual weaknesses, and the movie exceeded my expectations. It is reasonably fun to watch. It's not overall a good movie. The trailer gives away too much, but it does also give you a good idea of what the movie's like. If you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if you do not. The cover and poster, I mean, maybe a little bit, yeah. And also give you a good idea of what the movie is like. And yeah, on um, this has forty five percent on the tomato meter, seventy five seventy percent audience score is what I meant to say, based on over a thousand verified verified ratings. Monster Hunter is mostly a mindless blur of action held together by the slenderest threads of dialogue and plot, and exactly what many viewers will be looking for. Of the 95 reviewers, only 43 of them rated it fresh. So yeah, that's... that is indeed rotten. And on Metacritic, it has 47 out of 100, and 4.0 out of 10 for users. Yeah. 21 Metacritic critic reviews, 55 user reviews, and on let's see, on IMDb it has a thousand and eighteen user reviews, and several of the top ones are six and seven out of ten, and then a little further down, eight out of ten. And 147 external reviews, 78 of them were in languages I speak and not dead links. Yeah, 5.3 out of 10, based on 47,394 users voting. And yeah, 21.5 gave it 6, 21.5% gave it 6, 20.8% give it a 5, and that's, yeah, which is pretty, pretty common for, for his. So, being a PG-13 movie, the violence isn't, like, you know, the, the, it's, it's a little toned down, at least for the, the human characters and such. 
So the violence and gore is largely implied, but, you know, if you can get past that, there is some very effective gore in this. And when it comes to the creatures themselves, the gore is very detailed and nicely done, very effective. And... I recommend Outlaw Burns written review. This is not capital C cinema, it is cinematic junk food. And I think that might be about what I have to say in the review itself. So yeah, I recommend this to big fans of the games who really badly want a live-action adaptation and big fans of Paul W. Anderson. Now, the Blu-ray has 23 minutes of behind-the-scenes stuff. It's, it's fine. It's not really anything special. Like, if you buy, the, if you buy your own copy of this... You know, it it shouldn't be for the the Blu-ray special features. It should be so that because you want to have a copy that you can just watch any time. I actually, hmm, I think I meant to look up if you can, you know, where if anywhere you can stream it, but I completely forgot to. And. Right. My own rating for this. I mean, if I am just completely brutally honest and I'm going off of, like, entertainment value, yes, I rate this 7 Paul W. Anderson repeated mistakes out of 10. And, like... I would have rated it higher if more of the movie had been like the the chunk of it that's just incredibly fun. I guess it's probably to save on the budget. He knows that if he made the entire movie that fun, it would cost a lot more money. But yeah, if if the entire movie was as fun as about a third of it is, if the plot and characters were more compelling because I do think you can make this kind of thing work well with like yeah anyway that brings us to the spoiler sections the thoughts sections starting with disclaimers If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I can try to talk very fast to the disclaimers, since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section, once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. So... I am only spoiling this. I may bring up movies and TV shows that are relevant, but I... Either will not spoil them, or I will warn right before I do it. And hold up an index finger so you can mute and skip ahead if you want to avoid the spoilers. I just, did I, now that I think about it, I think I might have forgotten to note about spoilers at the start of this. Yeah, anyway. I, yeah, I, I will be warning if I spoil anything else, Paul W. Anderson. The only thing I will for sure spoil without warning in this video is this movie itself. So, let's see. The rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of this analysis, some of MST, MST3K, riff tracks, and other jokes. And, yeah, the section right after this one is thus the head of all watching. 
in chronological order, you could think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. Yeah, my back is really absolutely. Yeah, I think I'm gonna try to speed through the last bit of this. So yeah, the the let's see. I really appreciate that the female characters in this are not like disposable. They're you know there aren't. I'm not sure I would really say there are any misogynist tropes. They're not useless. They are strong. I don't. Th None of them are sexualized against their will and or only there for that purpose. I mean, I don't think there's a single female character in this that isn't a, f a hunter or a soldier or something. I guess the movie does okay on, like, ethnic minorities. Uh, Tony Jaws, the hunter character, is... Um, what's the word? He's definitely shown to be very capable. If not for his help, Artemis wouldn't have survived very long, so that might be... Um, but then at the very start... I mean, no, I guess it's more that the these soldiers are freaking out for no good reason, and what he does isn't dangerous to them. Yeah. And, yeah, this movie is in a genre where it is very important not to overexpose the threat. The creature, for example, does this movie do a good job of that? Yeah. I, you know, despite, like, the, the, you know, once you've watched this entire movie, you've spent several minutes looking at the spiders, but they aren't, we, we don't spend too long seeing them. And, yeah, violence and suspense it handles well. Now, that brings us to the final section. Notes taken while watching. So the, I forget if it was in the trailer or it was in like clips used by reviewers or what it exactly, but you see the cat thing wink using the eye that has been damaged. I'm just like, why wouldn't it just wink using the other, like, it must hurt to wink using the eye that's been damaged. Yeah. We open on an unattributed quote, because why not? As ridiculous as it is, the idea of a ship sailing, ship like that sailing through sand instead of water, is a neat visual. I think I heard that they made that up for this movie, that it isn't in the games. It's definitely the kind of thing that Paul W. Anderson comes up with. You know, he has a fascination with make taking vehicles and making them move in a way that they can't. You know, I suppose I won't say here exactly where it shows up, but he's taken ship like this and, and had it move through the air instead of water also. So here at the start of the movie we get the yeah, we get the kind of Paul Davis Anderson who knows how to make an exciting action scene. I hope that's the one we're stuck with for the rest of the movie. I think largely he handles the action pretty decently, yeah. Ooh, hey, let's flip over the car a bunch of time and, and edit it like really fragmented. I know, strobe lights. I want everyone to leave the theater with a massive headache. It looks like everyone made it through the flipping car without injury. What about Megan? Good? This shit is officially above my pay grade. I should have stayed at home attaching adamantium to mutant bones. And they start singing this song about how bad it is to be in the army. I like this camaraderie. It's nice. 
I guess when we see the hunter ready his bow, we're supposed to think that he's going to attack the soldiers. I'm not entirely sure. He, Paul doesn't always get suspense quite right. So they see a guy with a different skin color than them, who in other ways looks different than them. So they just start shooting? I didn't know Paul did satire. And we start seeing a little bit of the, I guess, Diablo. And wow, that is one horny monster. Fire! Nah, it's not working. Earth, wind, water. And two sequences of Humvees full of people flipping over within minutes of each other. Yeah, we are definitely in a Paul W. Anderson movie. Okay, the grenade belt bit was pretty cool. And they managed to get into a cave, but at first the monster keeps attacking. Keep shooting! Whatever you do, keep shooting! It's clearly having no effect on it, and I'm certain we will not need bullets. I like the how it like it keeps attacking the cave and eventually breaks off a horn and then it leaves. So later we can tell, oh, it's the same one. It's like, I want to say it's called Grid, which if you've seen that movie, you might know what I'm talking about. And if not, I don't want to give it away. And that's the one that they take down together, isn't it? Hunter and Artemis, I think, but uh, I've already forgotten. I just remembered that they encounter it again later, and I recognized it because it has the one horn and the other one's been broken off. See, that's the thing. Clearly, he understands some good movie making because that's the kind of thing. Like, in a video game, you don't need that specifically. But in a movie, oh, it's, it really helps that, you know, that's the thing that killed some of her soldiers, you know, or rangers, whatever they're called. After being trapped by the spider, Artemis checks what she has of supplies. It's not a lot, but she does have oxygen in case she needs a breather. And Artemis thinks she can save Link, so she lights up a flare. I don't know, and, and the spider's like, Shh. what was that thing waiting for? I, a dramatic entrance, I guess. Okay, fair enough. And the spider is bursting out of the eggs in T.I.'s chest. That was really messed up. Oh, that is some good body horror. Very, yeah. I appreciate it. I've, if, I, if I had a hat, I'd, I'd tip it. I wouldn't eat it, but I'd tip it. Makeshift flamethrower. Badass. And it's a good, like, it was established. She has flares and she has the, the ox yeah, oxygen spray thing. That can, I'm, I'm pretty sure that can... Be used as a make, makeshift flamethrower, yeah. And Artemis escapes the spider tunnel. It's clearly despairing, sitting there. She just realized she's in a Paul W. Anderson movie. And she takes a short break to go all golem on her wedding ring. I know, I'm not the first person to make that joke, but it's, it's too obvious. I gotta make that joke. Artemis throws a rock, and the spot that it hit, a Diablo pops up on the ground, but it doesn't actually do anything, so yeah, we're in a Paul W. Sanderson movie. I mean, I guess it's just there to tell us that that's what happened, but I mean, didn't we already know? I guess, I guess now we know that it doesn't need to be a Humvee. It can, it can happen with a small rock. Yeah. And Artemis reaches what I yeah, when I noted this, I wasn't entirely sure, but yeah, that's the shipwreck from the start of the movie, and this is legitimately a kind of fun setting. And so Hunter and Artemis, the two good guys, fight each other for no good reason. I don't know, I guess maybe he wants revenge for her people shooting at him earlier. I guess that's fair, but she did tell them to stop. She wasn't the one who told them to shoot. 
so during the day, the spiders don't come out, but at night, they're plentiful. That's a good detail. I can imagine might be from the games. And we see how the hunter gets food and water. Very clever. And the hunter looks at the dark tower and the massive bones in the... And then, you know, turns out, oh, she's no longer there. I, I mean, that's the thing. Like, in, in this movie, why does anyone ever bother tying someone's hands together? Because it never does any good. Artemis gets out of hers. The hunter doesn't... I, I don't think he at first gets out of them. He just, like, jumps over so that suddenly his hands are in front of him instead of behind them. Behind of him. Yeah, behind him. And, and, you know, they put her in, like, the hold of the ship. Wait, was it a ship? I don't know. I'm not even sure. That was one of their vehicles. But anyway, and, and she just... Why would you put the... the what's it called? The... the, lock, the, the yeah. Yeah, that, that lock thing on the inside rather than the outside of the cell. Like... And, and, you know, she gets out, and they don't even seem to care. They're just, okay, so there you are. So anyway, I wanted to have this conversation with you. I guess they were just going to have that conversation with, like, um, the Admiral, I'm going to say, uh, um, Ron Perlman, you know. He doesn't seem to mind that she escaped, so why did he even put her in prison? Why did he knock her out? Why didn't he just tell her, if you follow us, we might be able to help each other. There's, there's no good reason. Like, they want the same thing. They they both want to fight monsters. Like, you could so easily fix this. You just have, like, a thing where she seems to be... Like, let's say that... Actually, holy crap. All you had to have was for one of the others to see her and the hunter fighting each other. But that can't be the case. I'm, I'm almost certain. Because if cer certainly if they could have seen that, they would have gotten to them sooner. So, just, yeah. I don't know, it's, it's possible I missed a line or something because, wow, this movie just, yeah, it, it moves way too fast. And Artemis knocks out the hunter who won't let her drink any of his water. He'd rather waste it all. And, you know, then she knocks the figures that he had and then they fight again. I do really love the, the look, you know, like, when she, uh, yeah, when, you know, she throws something at his figures, and then he, you know, does this jump where suddenly his hands go from behind his back to in front of them, and she's like, "Oh crap!" <laughs> you know, she she did not expect him to be able to do that. And the hunter almost falls down to the spiders, and Artemis helps get him out of there. Yeah, the Hershey bar will make anyone your friend, no matter how much you beat them up. And and others have already pointed out, why does he freak out like that? Chocolate! You know, it's like, oh, okay, it's, you know, chocolate, it's, it's kind of good, I guess, but, you know, just... And, and we do see later, like, you know, he gets some flesh and he cooks it, and they both think that tastes good, so, you know, it's not like he's starving, Oh wait, he was he was living off the that moss thing. Okay, fair enough. You know, moss and then chocolate. You know, obviously there's a there's a difference there. And Hunter gives Artemis some water. Artemis dehydrated, rehydrates. Yes, that lightning. I think that's what brought me here. I gotta go dance with it. We poison it. Next time I play charades, I definitely want the hunter as a partner. And we get some more of the song about how bad it is to be in the, the army. I quite like the lyrics. And the spider has Artemis. Like, ah, what's it called? Has her, has her pinned, and the hunter jumps. Dude, if you jump in slow motion, you're not going to get there before she's dead. And as soon as they get away from that one spider, then there's like, you know, a dozen spiders, and it's like, 
Why was it hunting alone anyway? Why didn't, why wouldn't they just go together and, you know, now that Paul W. Anderson wants to raise the excitement, he, he wants to have more of them, so there's more of them, even though it would make more sense for there to be more of them earlier than, than later, like, anyway. I don't hate the montage of the spiders trying to get in. And we see the hunter make poison out of the spider, which, as far as I understand, is from the game. Like, you, know, you kill one monster, you get the ability to kill another monster. Sometimes it requires crafting. We get the training montage. And yeah, we see very clearly that it is the same Diablo because the horn is broken. Okay, either the poison is working, or that Diablo had a little bit too much to drink last night. And Artemis gives the hunter medical treatment. I guess I missed the reason for her dragging him all the way out there instead of them staying in a more safe place. Like, they were pretty close to the... Wait, was he still living in the ship? I think he was still living in the ship. And they, they were still pretty close to that, I'm almost certain. Seems like that would have been a much safer place... Like, the, she, where she goes, they end up completely buried in the sand because of the wind. So, right after she saved his life, he uses her as bait and then laughs. And, you know, she says, you know what I'm going to do the next time you're dying in the desert? Nothing. And, yeah, it's like, are we supposed to, are, are we supposed to like either of these characters? Because they do such deplorable things. Like, when, when we saw that he had water, I specifically thought, oh, you know, he's going to give her water and try to communicate to her, you and I are not enemies, we both want the monsters dead. But no, he, he specifically makes sure to not give her water, and then when she's about to drink some water, he knocks away the thing so she can't have any, it's just, yeah. Ron Perlman enters the movie. I mean, now that it's two-thirds of the way through, I guess this is a pretty good time for the movie to start getting good. And Ron Perlman speaks fluent English, because why not? The movie really should have started, you know, have stopped making sense by now. So if I understand it, right, it's called a palico. The, the cat chef really doesn't like anyone touching his knives, I guess, because it's like, you know why does it why does it care anyway like I could understand if she, like if she saw the food and were like ooh food and like plopped her unwashed hands right into it okay but, you know if if you're a chef that's like you know sacrilege but it's just it's it's just a knife and I'm you know I mean yeah because because she just escaped from the cell so she's like I might need a weapon and she reaches for it and and then, you know and it's like. Because Paul W. Anderson thought that it would freak the audience out if a cat hissed. That's basically it. Okay, fair enough. That's a decent enough explanation of why he speaks English. For, for a Paul W. Anderson movie, at least. Almost impossible to kill. Their only weakness is right before they breathe fire. Isn't it a tiny bit late for a tutorial? See, my issue there... I think he shouldn't be speaking as fluent or as smooth English as he does. Like, he should... Have like he doesn't he doesn't sound like someone who like so apparently he's the only one who speaks English in the New World and he only learned it because he studied it because a long time ago others came like it just yeah so the lava powers the tower which controls the storm which opens the gateway between worlds finally we're getting some real video game nonsense this is why I watch these movies. And, yeah, as with other Paul W. Anderson movies, if the entire movie was as ridiculous as the last third, then it would be a much more fun movie overall. I guess the reason she was able to survive that jump is supposed to be that once she went through the portal, it deposited her not very high above the ground. No, but wait, because when the... the um, yeah, I... Raphalos, was that it? I was about to say that, you know, big fans of the game were going to hate me for this, but I don't think I remember. No, I think it was called Raphalos, the, the fire-breathing one. When it comes through, it comes from, like, way up above. 
So, I, I don't know, I guess it's possible that the bigger you are, the, the higher up the portal deposits you, but now this is getting pretty ridiculous. Just, and again, like, you didn't have to do that. You could have just had that, like, once she falls through the portal, like, somehow the, like, maybe she lands on the very top of the, the plane that was about to airlift her out, but no, Anderson wants her to land all the way down and for them to find her and be like, how did this happen? It's too bad that some of this last bit was spoiled by the trailer, but I still enjoyed it. If monsters can move through the portal between worlds, then why isn't that happening all the time? Like, why isn't why isn't our world overrun by monsters? You know, considering that the you know the monsters don't have any natural enemies in our world. We're in the new world. They have to deal with hunters like. And again, it would be so easy just have it have a setup where for most of the movie the monsters don't have access to the portal, or have it be that you know what have maybe again I I I'm having trouble not trying to rewrite this movie to make it better. Imagine if the wedding ring that Artemis had was like some rare metal, and like her husband get got it for specifically. Because, you know, like she, she says early, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a U.S. Ranger. I'm not a, an archaeologist. Maybe her husband is an archaeologist. He thought it was really neat, you know, and he got her the ring. And when she gets close to the gate, the gate activates because of that metal. And then for the rest of the movie, only at the very end does the gate activate again. And then she's like, oh, no, it must be the ring. Oh, no, now monsters can get through the port, you know, something like that, Th you know. The monsters and whoever is in the tower has had access to this gate, the, the portal, the entire movie, you know, for however long before that as well. Why aren't they sending monsters through to the, the, to our world? You know, it just, it doesn't make any sense. And of course it cuts to credits before they defeat that last monster because this is a Paul W. Anderson movie, you know. He doesn't even have to write his name in the credits. If you've watched, okay, not just any of his movies, but he's made a lot of movies that end in sequel bait. And just, yeah. And that is actually everything. So, if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video you can watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. Recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.